program is a paid presentation. Wake up to the Word. Share an uplifting hour with grace and glory and Baltimore's faithful. Well, good morning and welcome once again to Baltimore's number one gospel program, Grace and Glory. Reverend Lee Michaels here. Of course, we always look forward to sharing with you each and every Sunday morning to inspire, encourage, and empower you as you start your day. We've got our spoken word coming up, but we also have our guests joining us with our very special men's segment, Pastor Ken Robinson from Dream Life Worship Center. So before we make our way to him, let's make our way to Southern Baptist and Bishop Dante Hickman right here on Grace and Glory. Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. By the time of our text, Noah had survived the flood and was striving to live and fulfill the directions given to him and his sons by God. God told Noah and his sons in the verses preceding the ones I read to you to be fruitful and to multiply in order to rebuild and repopulate the earth after the flood. And the Bible says that he gave them the sign of a rainbow as a covenant between God and man that God would never again cause a flood to destroy the earth. The rainbow was and is his promise to us to never destroy the world by flood again. This was important so that Noah and his family could move forward and fulfill the will of God without the fear that God would destroy them in his anger. So as they sought to rebuild the world and their lives, the Bible says that Noah became a farmer and planted a vineyard and one day drank of its produce and became drunk. Now I don't know uh, if Noah was overwhelmed by the trauma of the destructive flood he had just come through that made him drink until he became drunk. I don't know if Noah was overwhelmed by the tremendous responsibility of reconstructing the world that he once knew that made him drink until he became drunk. And I don't know if Noah was overwhelmed by the thirst for grapes from sanctified soil that made him drink until he became drunk. But what I do know is that trauma, tremendous responsibility, and the thirst for something new can make you drink until you become drunk. Well, let me not assume. Let me just ask you, what makes you drink until you get drunk? Is it stress? Is it overdue bills? Is it family dysfunction? Is it missed deadlines? Is it peer pressure? Is it rejection? Is it regret? Is it missed opportunities? Or is it just for fun? If the truth be told, some of us don't know the reason and others of us don't need a reason to get drunk. The fact of the matter is, life can happen to us in different ways and elicit different responses and coping mechanisms to deal with it. Subsequently, Noah, was a good and godly man, but he got drunk. And before you go and judge him or anybody else, try to empathize with the weight of the world that's on their shoulders and pray for them. I don't know what you're dealing with, but I'm praying for you that God would help you through it and that God would help you with it. Come on, somebody help me preach right there. Tell somebody beside you, I don't know what you're dealing with, but I'm praying for you, that God will help you with it and God will help you through it. Noah, my dear brothers and sisters, had challenges. And to make matters worse, he had consequences for his actions. Because the Bible says when he got drunk, he ended up naked in his tent. And the Bible says that his son Ham <coughs> saw him and began to laugh and spread what he saw to others. Now this is where I have problems with Ham and with people like him because at least Noah was drunk in his own tent. 
And, and can I tell you that if you can't handle my nakedness, then stay out of my tent. Come on, somebody help me preach. <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not always anointed. I'm not always appointed. I'm not always blessed and, and the highly favored person that you see on Sunday. And if the truth be told, neither are you. You look better today than you look any other day during the week. You look more holy on Sunday morning than you look on Sunday afternoon. The fact of the matter is, my dear brothers and sisters, that if you can't handle my moments of temptation, if you can't handle my moments of procrastination, if you can't handle my moments of recreation, then you and yours need to stay out of my tent. Preach, Dante. The fact is, all of us have issues that can lead to exposure. But do we have the instinct of love to cover one another? I know you know how to judge folk. I know you know how to point your long bony finger down on somebody else's mess and on somebody else's sins. But the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, Brethren, if one of you is overtaken in a fault, then you who are spiritual, you who are holy, you who are all of that and a bag of chips should restore them in the spirit of meekness. Basically knowing that you got your own weakness. Come on, look at that strong person sitting beside you and tell them you got your own weakness. Don't sit up here in front. But, but let that be a lesson, my dear brothers and sisters, because according to this text, it was Noah's own son that didn't cover his own father's nakedness. And let that be a lesson for all of us that those we cover may not always cover us. Don't look now, but there are some folk that can't wait to catch you dipping. There's some folk that can't wait to catch you slipping. There's some folk that can't wait to catch you tripping and cussing somebody out. They look at you and see how blessed you are and the impact that God is having in your life. But as soon as they find one spot, as soon as they find one blot, then here they come writing an article, doing a, a news report. Here they come gossiping and backbiting and backstabbing. But my dear brothers and sisters, can you imagine now the shame of it all? When Noah woke up from his drunken stupor and discovered everything that he had worked so hard to do and everything he had worked so hard to, to become had become overshadowed by his own indiscretions and his indecent exposure that was promulgated by his own immature and insensitive son. Noah had to deal with the shade and the shame. And can I tell you, Southern, that there's nothing quite like dealing with the shade of a betraying family member or a friend. You can expect somebody that really doesn't know you to, to stab you in the back. You can expect an enemy or a or, or person that has not walked with you, who doesn't understand who you are, to try to betray you. But boy, doesn't it hurt when people with the same name, with people with the same blood, with people who go to the same church, with people who identify as social media friends and followers end up being the one that stab you in the back but I've discovered I've discovered that you can grow up from that kind of hurt once you realize that people are just people come on help me preach look at somebody tell them people are just people I don't care if they blood relatives I don't care if they best friends everybody has the proclivity to talk about you the people you talk to about other people will one day start talking about you and you can't internalize it you've got to use their hateration as your elevation to where God is trying to take you no, my dear brothers and sisters, grow up from getting upset about the people that sometimes stab you in the back. The real question is how do you deal with the debilitating psychological effects of shame? And I want to park here parenthetically on this Father's Day to say that not every father is an absentee father. 
and not every father is an abusive father. I pray for those who have those kinds of memories of those kinds of fathers, but I also want to caution you to still give God praise because although your father may have been absent and although he may been, have been abusive, your heavenly father brought you through it, your heavenly father is healing you despite it, and your heavenly father is still showing you that no weapon that has been formed and used against you is able to prosper but I want to preach today about the number of afraid and ashamed fathers I, I want to deal with that because what shame does is it causes us to look inward and view everything about ourselves as negative to the point that even taking responsibility for the things that we should becomes almost impossible because we feel inadequate and we feel unworthy. And fathers and people in general are afraid and ashamed. What, what are we afraid and ashamed of? We're afraid and we're ashamed of our imperfections. We're afraid and we're ashamed of our inabilities. We're afraid and we're ashamed of our inadequacies and our insecurities. Nevertheless, God sent me with a word for every father and for every person who has been living in the fear and the shame of your imperfections, your inabilities, and your insecurities. And that word is to tell you that you don't have to be perfect. Come on, somebody help me preach. God said you don't have to be perfect. And you don't have to be able to do everything. And you don't have to be secure in all things. I found out that you can have flaws but still have favor. Preach, Dante. You can be broken but still be blessed. And you can be insecure but still be indispensable. I wish I had about 20 people in here that can testify that life for you has not been a crystal stare. You've had some flaws you made some mistakes things have not always added up to you you've not always been qualified but somehow and some way God was still able to use you and God was still able to bless you and I'm preaching this sermon my dear brothers and sisters because the enemy of our destiny wants to keep us paralyzed in the trap of our shame and wants to make us think that we need other people's approval to live in our divinely ordained purpose and power. But I need the whole church to shout, the devil is a liar. Because Noah's testimony is proof positive that you can and you will recover. Can, can I preach like I feel it? God sent me on this Father's Day to tell some father and to tell somebody who's been living in shame, been living in fear, that you can recover from exposure. You can recover from embarrassment. You can recover from inadequacy. You can recover from bad decisions, from past failures, from drug addictions, from alcoholism, from low self-esteem, from a lack of spiritual discipline. You can recover from scandal and you can recover from self-centeredness. Let, let me go ahead and get to it. How do I know? You will recover when you discover your partners are greater than your persecutors. That's point number one. Write it down if you're watching online. Your partners are greater than your persecutors. Genesis 9 verse 23 says, But Shem and Japheth took a garment, they laid it on both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. They heard about it, but they did not laugh about it. Instead, they helped their father to recover. Well, while Noah had one son that ridiculed him, hey here, he had two sons that restored him. Y'all ain't feeling 
telling me. And I want to help somebody to know that if God be for you, then he's more than the whole world against you. And God sent me here to tell you that you ought to always know uh, that, that where the devil, where there's one devil fighting against you, that God has many more angels uh, that are fighting for you. And I found out that sometimes we have no idea of who is really praying for us. We have no idea of who is really pulling for us. We have no idea of who is really looking out for us. You think that you are in it all by yourself. You think you're the only one that's catching hell and the whole world is laughing at you. But God sent me here to tell you that there are more that be with you than are against you. The other day I was speaking for the second time in a leadership program before a number of corporate executives and social and political leaders and someone asked me, how do I maintain a message of hope and optimism to my people in the midst of a, of a city with so much corruption. I heard everything that was layered in that question. I said, first, the perceived corruption does not originate with the African-American leaders that we see castigated on the news, but that there are greater powers where the money resides, where the money resides, where the money resides, that perpetuates a system of corruption and oppression, and those people don't get locked up. Those people don't get thrown in jail. Those people don't go away for, for books and for gift cards. I, I wanted to be clear up front that the people who are being publicized, prosecuted, and penalized as corrupt are not the source as much as they are the scapegoat for the system and unseen powers that be of the corruption. Let me get that off. Nevertheless, I told them that our grace and hope is in Christ who has called us to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And despite the trajectory of this world, the people of God will always outlast, outnumber, and overcome the darkness. And somebody here needs to know that you are not in this thing alone. And if we're going to survive, everybody can't be a ham. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell them everybody. Everybody can't be a ham. We might have a, a two or three hams in this church, but we got more Japheths and Shims in this church that are willing to help each other to recover. I need every Shim spirit and every Japheth spirit to look down your row and tell your row, I got you covered. I'm not going to be the one to talk about you. I'm not going to be the one to laugh at you when you lose your job. I'm not going to be the one that, that's going to be talking about your child that's in the street. I'm the one that's going to be praying for you. I'm the one that's going to be helping you with a meal. I'm the one that's going to help you to get a job. I'm the one that's going to help you to recover. God sent me back here with this word to tell somebody that you will recover when you discover your partners are greater than your persecutors. But then number two, you will recover when you discover your power is greater than your perception. Come on, say that with me. My power is greater than my perception. Genesis 9, 24 says, so Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. And when he woke up, the Bible says he cursed Ham. And he, and he blessed Shem and he blessed Japheth. And he told them what they were going to get and that Ham was going to be their servant. I don't know. I don't know if I like that, but Noah even showed grace in that. He put somebody that could be trusted to become their servant. His Shem and Japheth had to, had to turn and look at their eyes sideways, not knowing when Ham was going to betray them. Yet, my dear brothers and sisters, despite Noah's failures and flaws, he still had the power, listen, to bless and to curse. Y'all ain't feeling me. 
I'm trying to help you to understand that whatever you do, don't ever mistake my moments of weakness to define or delimit who I am. Yeah, you might catch me falling. You might catch me cussing. Child, you might catch me drinking. You might catch me losing my mind. Don't, but don't ever mistake my moments of weakness to define who God has created me to be. Because what the enemy doesn't know is that as a child of God, I will wake up from my mess. Preach, Dante. Yeah, Noah was drunk on the eve of reconstruction, but the Bible says when he woke from his wine, somebody shout when he woke from his wine. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. The Bible says he woke up from his mess, and I will wake up from my mess, and you will wake up from your mess. We will wake up from our depression. We will wake up from our, our sins and you would want to be on my blessing side and not on my cursing side my God I'm preaching this sermon because what I found out was that the exposure of my weakness does not stop the effectiveness of God's word through me and God's word over me no wonder the apostle Paul said that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellent of the power may be of God and not of us. I thank God for my education, but it ain't my education that makes me who I am. I thank God for my upbringing, but it ain't my upbringing that makes me who I am. I thank God for the clothes on my back, for the shoes on my feet, for the car that I drive, for the roof that's over my head, for the money I have in the bank, for the church that I'm blessed to pastor, but no None of those things make me who I am, but it's by the grace and the mercy of God that I'm still anointed. I'm still the head and not the tail. I'm still the lender, even when I'm borrowing money. I'm still above and I'm not beneath. I need 20 folk to jump up and shout. After all this time, God's hand is still on my life. Have I got a witness here. I ain't just talking to the young folk. I need some folk that's 70, some 80 year olds, some 90 year olds that can testify through many dangers, toils, and snares. I've already come. It was grace that brought me safe thus far, and it'll be that grace that will lead me on. Can I preach like I feel it? Thank y'all for coming to church for one more Sunday uh, the Bible says uh, that you will recover uh, you will recover uh, when you discover uh, that your partners uh, are greater than your persecutors you will recover uh, when you discover uh, that your power uh, is greater than what you perceive it to be uh, and you will recover uh, when you discover uh, that your purpose uh, is greater than your pride Say it with me. My purpose is greater than my pride. Preach, Dante, preach. Verse 28 and 29 says Noah lived after the flood 350 years so that all the days of Noah's life were 950 years and then he died. You mean to tell me, Terrence, that he did not die when he was uncovered. You mean to tell me Terrence that he did not die when he was exposed. I'm sure that Noah was ashamed embarrassed and mortified at how his greatness did not prevent his weakness from being exposed and I don't care how much of a superman or a wonder woman you may be all of us have some kryptonite that can take us down but you ought to thank God that it cannot ultimately take you out can I preach like I feel it good morning church may the Lord bless all of y'all real real good but I've told you over the last 20 years my testimony of being placed in a tub 
of hot scalding water as a three year old child by my own stepfather that experience left my feet and parts of my back severely burned I almost didn't live they had to do blood transfusions made the mistake of giving me sickle cell trait blood but thank God there's not a sign of sickle cell in my body there I was with burned feet for a while as a child I was disabled and I had to use a wheelchair to get around but Deacon Corpru the hardest part was having to live with my own shame of the burns that wouldn't let me walk around barefooted when we went to the pools and the splash parties in my own neighborhood and whenever and wherever I had to take off my socks I had to explain the scars and the scene behind the scars it made me feel like I had to hide myself in order to be accepted as myself it caused me to feel abnormal apprehensive and unable to love myself and to live out loud but I learned that I was not what was done to me preach I said I learned that I was not what was done to me and God sent me to tell somebody that you are not what was done to you you're not a slave you're not a victim you're not a convict you're not a statistic you're not a thought you're not a loser you're not a dead be dead God has a purpose for your life and you're gonna live and not die to declare the works of the Lord well the man who burned my feet eventually could not walk and lived in a wheelchair and subsequently he died and I don't glory in the vengeance but I glory in the victory that what the devil meant for evil God turned it for my good goodbye y'all Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me they hung him high they stretched him wide he hung his head for me he died but that's not how the story is because in three days he rose again because his purpose was greater than his pride so lift up your hands lift up your heads stick out your chest and shout I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth walk in your anointing walk in your authority walk in your power walk in your agreement walk in your victory work together children don't you get tired pray together children don't you get tired there's a great camp meeting in the promised land yay yes yes I think I ought to tell you the doctors told me I wouldn't be able to walk for a long time you will recover whatever the scar whatever the shame whatever the pain whatever the mistreatment whatever the misunderstanding you will recover because your partners are greater than your persecutors your power is greater than your perception and my God your purpose is greater than your pride look at somebody say, tell them I should be dead by now but I'm still alive 
because God's got a purpose over my life. And since I'm alive and the devil can't do nothing about it, I might as well give God the best shout I can. Somebody praise his name. Hey, yeah. You've been watching the television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church, where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor. If you desire to purchase a copy of this week's broadcast or any of our other media treasures, please call our media ministry at 410-732-8566. Wow, what a powerful word, as always, from Dr. Hickman. Uh, thank you so much for bringing that powerful word again. Uh, we praise God for another opportunity to come on this grace and glory. Great, great Sunday morning, excited Sunday morning, because we know that God is going to move in a very powerful way. Uh, today, again, for our men's segment. Oh, boy, I messed up, Reg. I did. Hold up. I'm at to start all over. Well, good morning. God bless you again. Welcome to Grace and Glory. Thank God for Dr. Hickman, a very powerful word. I'm Dr. Kenneth Robinson, your host. I'm so thrilled uh, to be here for another men's segment of Grace and Glory. I have another special guest today that I know is going to bless your heart. This is one of the young men, black men that are doing extraordinary things uh, in our city. And listen, he's going to come and share some powerful things with you today. I'm talking about Reginald Gant. Reginald Gant, who is the president of Serve for Men. That's right, Serve for Men. He's with us today, and I want him to come right now. And let's talk, Reg. Dr. Robinson, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you. You're doing such great things uh, for men. And um, I know in particular you have a special service to provide wheels for men. Talk about that. Absolutely. So, Dr. Ken, my wife and I have been proudly serving in this space, uh, honestly, since 2005. So, as you can see, it's something that's really near and dear to our hearts. And um, we love the fact that we get to provide wills and estate planning to those who really need it the most. When we looked at the statistics, we saw that about seven out of 10 Americans didn't have a last will in place um across you know the nation but when we dug a little deeper in our minority communities right in our communities of color black and brown people there were nine out of ten of us that did not have a will in place wow. and it's for different reasons. Nine, nine out of ten nine out of ten of us in the, in the minority community don't have a will so we wanted to be a solution to that problem dr ken wow you know i i didn't i'm a pastor and I, this this statistic should not surprise me because i know all the chaos unfortunately that centers around um, around the time of funerals in our community uh, and so talk about how important it is for men to make sure that they have a will for their families absolutely it's of the utmost importance and what a will is for anybody who may not be familiar it's literally your last love letter to your family so it's basically saying you know I'm going to be responsible enough to make sure that I steward and take care of everything that God has given me. That's good. Even after my death. So the will kicks in after, uh, you know, the, the end of life for an individual, but the will spells out exactly what that person wants done with their estate, their assets, and everything that they work so hard for. So for men, Dr. Ken, especially, you know, those that I talk to, you know, hopefully for those that are listening, um, it's everything for you to have that in place because if you don't make those decisions for your family and for your loved ones i just need you to know that the state in which you reside in will and chances are they won't care as much about your family as much as you do wow that, that's amazing and now now let me tell you i know men sometimes have this fear to go to the doctor we have this fear to start planning out our will because we think it means we're gonna die early now <laughs> okay what, what how do we get wills kind of tell us how easy it is for a man to get a will it's very easy so through the service that my wife and i've been offering it's called legal shield and um i'll just share quickly some of the reasons why men don't get the wills right procrastination is one we always feel like we have a lot of time we never know when our expiration date is going to come unfortunately um men think that it's too expensive a lot of times they don't know where to start but i just want to share a service dr ken that's really easy it's affordable it's accessible 
and literally you can download a uh, an app on your mobile phone. That's how easy it is. We all walk around with our mobile phones 24-7. We're always on it because we're always on social media. So getting the will, Dr. Ken, is as easy as downloading a mobile app to your cell phone, filling out a will questionnaire, and in a few days, a few weeks after that, having the official living will, last will and testament and medical directives in place for your family. Wow, that's it crazy. is painless and it is affordable. So it's not just leaving money, but also leaving medical provision too. Man, Absolutely. this is powerful. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 to 22, that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Men, the enemy wants to steal our legacy. It is our responsibility to maintain, restore, and to keep our legacy in place. And so thank you so much, uh, Reginald Gann, for just sharing this powerful information. Uh, his information is on the bottom of the screen. You can contact him right away. Listen, I've used his service because I knew the importance of having a will established for my family. And I know you do too, man. Let's not procrastinate, let's get it done. Real quickly, closing remarks, Reggie, as we leave. Uh, absolutely. Uh, again, you've said it all. Uh, it's our responsibility to steward what God has given us. So if you're a man under the sound of my voice, if you're a woman under the sound of my voice, I encourage you to get your will today. It's affordable, it's easy, it's accessible, and it will give you the peace of mind that you and your family deserve. I'm glad you mentioned that it is not just for men, but also you can provide wills for women, also single mothers who may be out there. Let's get it done. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Reginald Gant. We've been a great guest. We appreciate all that you've shared. And listen, Grace and Glory, we are thankful that you tune in every single week to our men's segment. Thank you so much for your support and prayers. Well, we're going to go to our second spoken word, and that is by Pastor Jacob, Jason Clark, who is the pastor of the Omega Church right here in Baltimore. Let's go to that word. You've seen the sign, stop in sometime, 4424 Painterson Road, Omega Church, 10 a.m. Sunday. See you there. I'm glad that you joined us here on Grace and Glory, and we hope that you have your Bibles open, you're in prayer, and you're ready for praise and preaching. The Word of God is coming to you right now. Be blessed. Here's where we go. He says punishment for improvement. He says reprove you to improve you. I just want to make sure those are in your head. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. So he says, who is that person? Jesus. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Right. So, so think about what Jesus had to go through, though he was perfect. And then look at yourself, and you're not perfect, I'm not perfect, and consider what we're complaining about. Oh, God, God. All right, all right. Jesus handled hostility from haters with all humility. No hubris, no arrogance, no conceit. He said, I know they're hating on me, but I came to be hated oh, God. so that I can make you holy. I came to be hated so I could cause a reconnection between you and God. So if I have to be hated for you to get to heaven, I'll take it. All right. All right. All right. Jesus will handle hostility from haters with, 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 with grace. Watch this. He says, weary and discouraged. Now, I want to talk to people in here who like me, but just every now and then get a little weary and discouraged. Anybody tired of being talked about? Tired? Tired of being talked about? Tired of being lied on? I tell you. Tired of, being okay. tired of being disliked. I mean, if you're going to dislike me, at least dislike me for a reason I gave you. Just tired of being disliked. Tired of being misused. Oh my God. Tired of being abused. Tired of being unappreciated. Oh my God. Are you discouraged in some way by death? Nobody's discouraged by death. I said, we're rich, shut up. Discouraged by disease. Discouraged by despair. If, if you're tired and discouraged, he said, this message is for you. If you're weary and discouraged, this message about being reproved to be improved is a message sent from heaven for you. Watch this, it's going to go somewhere. You have not yet resisted bloodshed, striving against sin. As bad as you think you have it, as hard as you think it is, 
You have not tried to live your best. In fact, many of us have had an attitude of I'm good enough. I'm, I'm good enough. Right? And the reason why that's important is because so often stopping sin has not caused us to shed any blood. Mm -hmm. Right? You haven't brought what you're talking about like a horse. Nope. So whenever you get ready to say the wrong thing or talk about somebody you shouldn't be talking about, you just do what? Nope. Say it. Right? You haven't resisted yourself from doing that thing you don't want to do. Whatever that thing is, I don't want to call it because I'm making it yours. But whatever the sin is, we have participated in it, right, without any obstacles or prevention. We jumped on in. Hey, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And so, so the text goes on to say in Hebrews 12, 1 through 4 through the Message Bible, I love it because it gives us a real representation in our present day language what he's trying to say. In this all out match against sin. And here's the thing that we're not saying in church. Because we want people to get cars and houses and promotions. And we want people to get delivered and blessed and live wonderful. We have to tell people you are in an all-out match against sin. You are fighting right now for the faith. You are trying to maintain a level of integrity that reflects your responsibility in connection to the Christ that has saved your soul. Somebody say amen. I'm trying to live like I love him. Y'all better say amen. See, here we wouldn't accept this in relationship. Brian comes home and says, I think I'm a good enough husband. You're like, what? She would have, he would have a whole hickey on top of his head. I was faithful Monday through Thursday. I gotta be faithful on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for He said, hold, hold, hold on, let me go get this pain. Stand right there. Let me get this, let me get this pain. Who would accept that? Stacy, Rich says, look, I, I'm gonna be faithful three and a half days a week. You would take him back out on the cruise and dump him right overboard. That does not work. It, it, it doesn't work, but yet that's how we do that. I came to church on Sunday. I gave you your two hours. Excuse me, an hour and a half. I gave you a couple of dollars, Lord. I tipped you for what I had. He says, in all this match against sin, others have suffered worse than you. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. When, when I, when I was about to have this pity party yesterday about being at the church, we had to get there early, so a little, little bit of sleep I tried to do on Saturday and it was gone. And, and I got there and I was, I was just venting to Tremaine and she just, you know, she, she's good, she just listens. I don't know if she's listening, but she looks like she's listening. <laughs> I'm venting, I'm venting because, you know, I'm, I'm tired. And I was running here, I tried what we have doing this, and, and I was sitting there and the guy said, oh, you got it so bad, don't you? You could just sit here in this beautiful church, and there's people out here who don't even have abilities. Here you have two and three. Y'all ain't saying nothing to them. Here you are complaining that you could sit here and work with kids, and somebody's gonna bury their child today. Here you go. Come on. Your son is sitting over there. He didn't brought donuts for all the kids, and so you, the, the, the son that didn't talk to you two years ago, y'all ain't helping me in here. It's the, the same son. You, you really, you really got it bad, don't you? You really, you really don't have things are really going bad. And, and you gonna have lunch with these young people, and they're gonna bless you. They're gonna sing. They're gonna dance. All this stuff. You really got it bad. You really start thinking about how good you got it. Count so many blessings, name them one by one, and you might just realize just how good God has been. You think about a church. Come on, help me here. In the midst of a pandemic that loves you, cares for you. Amen. It's concerned about you. People that look out for you. And you're going to sit here and have a pity party. I got on my knees. Tremaine, when I got on my knees, I began to thank God. God, forgive me for every complaint because there are people who are suffering worse than you. I'm going to preach y'all sit there. Amen. There are people in your Bible Day, Texas right now who are crying because their eight-year-old, eight nine-year-old, and ten-year-old won't get to see middle school. And yet we in here like God hadn't been good to somebody on the shout glory. The Lord has been good to us. People have it worse than you. Anytime you don't believe it, I got two places for you to go. First, go on out there to King Memorial. Amen. Get out your car and walk by some of the tombstones and the placards uh, and read the date on them. Uh, some of them were born after you uh, and died before you. You better learn how to give God some praise. Uh, and if you don't like the cemetery, come on, go with me down to Hopkins uh, or Kennedy Creek. Uh, or come on now and look at some of these babies in, in hospitals with leukemia and the Hodgkin's disease. I wish I had somebody in here that would testify. There are people that got it worse than me. be so lucky 
to work out with Omar Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Yeah. Amen. I should be so lucky to have a beautiful, wonderful church. Terrence as a brother, Ryan as a brother. I should be so blessed as that. And yet, and it's all about matching and sin. Others have suffered far worse than you to say nothing of what Jesus went through. All that bloodshed. So don't feel sorry for yourself. I'm good, I'm good. Don't feel sorry for yourself. I, I was having my own little pity party. Jermaine didn't even get the invitation. She was just in there. Having to sit through all that mess. Look at me over here doing, look at me over here doing it. And yet God has clothed me with a reasonable portion of health and strength. Ain't that why we went to black colleges? I'm going to mess with all you sorority and fraternity brothers. Ain't that why y'all join? Amen. Those organizations to help, to serve, to make sure those who didn't have, they meant to look out for the less. Well, isn't that what they say? I'm going to mess with you. Scholarship uplift. Come on now. Ain't that part of it? We're supposed to do this. This is in our fabric of who we are. We're supposed to give back. And yet we haven't even shared any blood in the efforts of which we are doing. Which means we really aren't not just doing that much. We really aren't. This really, this really isn't that much. Who wouldn't get four hours a weekend if instead of 300 murders a year, we only had three? Who wouldn't help with an after school program if instead of just your child going to college, all of them went? Who would sacrifice two or three hours? Let's see, that guy that, said, God, God, help me. Oh, I'm not mad at Fox News for what they're saying, because they're only saying what they're seeing. My problem with Fox News is what are they solving? All right. All right. Don't tell me what the problem is. Tell me what the solution could be if all of us came together as a community. Yeah. 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 Amen. So the Bible walks on, he says, in any. Have you forgotten this exhortation? Yes. So it says, even in the midst of your tribulation, God has some exhortation. I like that. In the midst of my mess, he has a message. In the midst of my problem, he has a proclamation. All right. In the midst of what I'm going through, he has something to say to you. Are y'all going to say amen? amen? He says, remember the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. Watch this. He says, remember this. Whenever God tells us to remember, it's important. Whenever God suggests to us that memory is connected to what he's about to say, it's important. So when he says, do the communion, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Somewhere around Deuteronomy chapter 8, he says, and thou shalt remember all the ways that I led you through the wilderness these 40 years, uh, amen, and I kept you, and so your clothes didn't get old, your shoes didn't wax, amen. I'm so glad to put on some old outfits this morning. I had to have these shoes resold because I had had these shoes. These shoes are older than Omar. Y'all ain't help me here. I'm trying to tell you something. They might look new, but I had them resold. This, this thing I didn't got 2010. It's 12 years old. This robe I have on, I, I put it on because God wanted to Remind me uh, that, that he's kept me from a long y'all better not. I wish I had that Timmy y'all over there. Yeah, yeah, he is a keeper. Yes, he is. Yeah. He's kept you through this and that. And then the Bible says, My son, my daughter, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. It is necessary. I got 15 minutes. It is necessary, Chris. Don't be discouraged when you are rebuked for by him for whom the Lord loves. He chastens. And scorches every son in whom he receives and daughter. Punishment has a purpose. Amen. Jason, if you're watching this, don't get mad. <laughs> For my son, my son is you I love looking at our children because they remind us of the reflection of the rebellion that was in us once upon a time. <laughs> And I'm determined to be the father, like the prodigal son's father, just to allow him to learn the lesson on his own. Mm -hmm. So when I opened up the garage for him to come in this morning after he's sleeping, sleeping in the car, I was thinking to myself, <laughs> was it worth it? 
because you know he got dressed and he got the guy that came in from work and smelling good and he got all cleaned up and, and had a you know had, a, had an AT shirt on. I won't call it white beard because we shouldn't be the whites, but you know he had the white shirt on. He so he had that on. He was going out. I said, man, where's your shirt? I'll send the car. But he got this new three hundred dollar tattoo he wanted us to see. It was shining too, okay? It was shining. I said, I said, man, look at him. And Jermaine wants so bad to put rules in Richard. I said, no, no, let him learn. Let him learn. He said, Dad, I may not come home. I said, you may not come home. I said, okay, you grown. Don't come home. I said, Jermaine just looked at me. She said, you ain't going to say that. I said, I did. I said, be safe. He said, don't worry, Dad, I'm going to text you. So around 11.30, we got to the bed because we got to get up for church. And I texted him. I said, man, be safe out there. The door's locked. <laughs> so you won't be coming back here tonight. Because anything that moves in my house, what well, it ain't supposed to, meets an unfortunate end. So I started the office, and when I opened the garage this morning, to let him in. Knocked on his car, said, now come on in, come on in. And, and, I, and I wondered to myself, is it worth it? Because I remember sleeping on the doormat in Hilton Head Island when I, at his age, missed curfew. And she locked the door. And Hayden Wingrove's mom said, well, if you want to stay out, stay out. Because when my door is locked, I'm not, my punishment has a purpose. Because if she wasn't bad, I don't know if I'm going to be uncomfortable my back in that car seat too many times. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? Sometimes God allows you the leash to lose your mind. So that when you find your mind, you know how to get back to him that loves you more than the club and outside ever will. I wish I had ten. Punishment has a purpose. I want you to get this. If you endure chastening, if you endure it, so he didn't come in disrespectful, he didn't knock on the door, scream and holler, let me in this house. He said, I'm going to endure this chastening. And then he gets to decide, as many of us, whether outside is better than inside. Are y'all listening to me? Because now as an older person, I think back to myself and I say, no, nah, it was never worth it. Because it came home. Well, how many of you now know that coming home is a good thing? Yeah. Man, if I had stayed home, the kind of money I'd have. Man, if I had stayed home, the kind of trouble I didn't get in. Man, if I had stayed. Y'all can see, see, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as a son. Or daughter, for whom, what son or daughter is there that the God that loves them has not chastened? Some of us you get beat, and let me tell you, the beat didn't do anything better for me. In fact, sometimes the beating is worse than the lesson. Because all it teaches you the how to do is lie better, not live better. I'm going somewhere. But only the chosen can endure chastisement. Only the chosen can judge us because most of us don't want to be punished. Yeah. I remember the first time I got fired. I remember the first time I had a car repossessed. I remember some, uh, the first time I, I tried to get something on credit and I couldn't because my credit was so bad. See, the chastisement, it changed me. The chastisement made me think about that thing again. I stepped back and I said, you know what? I needed this chastisement to change me. But only the chosen can endure chastisement. Here we go. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, you are illegitimate. If you're not willing to be chastised, you will never be changed. If you are not willing to be punished, you will never be promoted. All of us have got to endure something. Somebody say amen. And all I'm saying to you is that God uses punishments purposefully in order to get you better than what you would be had he not punished you. Somebody say amen. So he says, we have been punished because we are partakers. We are partakers because we are considered God, and we consider God as our parent. And let me say something to you. God chastises all of us according to us, not according to the rest of us. Why aren't y'all shouting? God punishes us according to us and not according to the rest of us. 
He doesn't put my punishment on you. He doesn't put your punishment on me because he knows all of us are different. Somebody ought to say amen. All of us are different. So how he punishes Maylene, he's going to, he's going to treat Stacy different. How to punish Stacy, he's going to treat my sister right different. He's going to treat my right different. And, and the reason is not because he doesn't love you, it's because he knows what you can handle. And he knows what's going to handle you. And so, Shakini, you might get punished where he takes something away. The other person might get punished, he gives it all to him. Now, you say, why did he give them all this? Because he knows when they get all that, it's going to mess them up the same way it's going to mess you up by taking it away. God knows us each individually, though he loves us collectively. Why aren't y'all saying that? And so the Bible then goes on to say, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us. Now, here's the one thing I will always maintain. I have not been a perfect parent. All right. Some of y'all agree that. Me, not so much. Right. This thing, parenting, man, I wish they came with instructions. I mean, some type of something on the back or something on behind the ear. Because these kids are tough. And you think they're tough in the terrible twos. Wait till they get into the terrible twenties. I said, I love my son. My boy said, he said, Dad, I need to borrow $40. I said, boy, he said, but gas. I said, oh, of course, of course, of course, I'm here. He said, yeah, because I'm saving my money to get this tattoo. <laughs> You've seen the sign, stop in sometime. 4424 Painters Road, Omega Church, 10 a.m. Sundays. See you there. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast ministry of Omega Baptist Church and Ministries. Once again, I am Pastor Jason Clark, and if this ministry has blessed you, if the word has touched your life, I pray that you're led by the Spirit of God to send in an offer and be a blessing to this ministry. If we blessed you with the word of God, I pray that you would share some of what God has blessed you with, with this ministry. Send a tithe, send an offering, send a seed offering, wherever you are laid. And I'm asking God that he bless you some 30, some 60, some 100 fold return for everything that you give to this ministry. Thank you for tuning in and God bless you. Well, Saints, hope you've enjoyed the program today. I know I've enjoyed being here with you and looking forward to uh, uh, the coming week. We've got the 4th of July, uh, of course, right around the corner. And I've got a birthday celebration also coming on the 14th, but we'll be celebrating in a very special way on the 23rd, the resumption of the Heaven 600 Summer Cruise Series. Listen, we would love for you to join us. To find out more information, go to cityexperience.com or keep listening to Heaven 600. We'll be on bright and early tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. with the morning experience. Until next Sunday, though, as we make our way back here, continue to walk in His grace and live in His glory. And we'll see you right here next week on Grace and Glory.
Stay 